Hello, David Clark here from DVC Training, and today I'm going to be looking at an AI video enhancement program called AVC Labs Video Enhancer. Did a couple of videos recently. One was about upscaling using Topaz, and another one was about colorizing video using a thing called HitPaw, both of which AI. This is an alternative to those two, and it actually does do both colorizing and upscaling as well. So I'm, I'm going to give you a quick run through on the interface and then look at some of the results. Whilst I was making this video, they came out with an update which did actually improve things quite a bit in different areas. So rather than refilming the whole thing, I've just added in a couple of extras showing off what was new in the update. Primarily, they added the ability to sharpen video and they enhanced the colorizer. So when you open it up, you've got a simple little interface where you load up a clip. I've got the main clip that I'm watching here. I can add in more clips just by clicking down here and going off and finding them. And then I've got all the controls for the upscaling over here. And this is where you've got lots of different options for how you're going to fiddle with the footage that you've got. First of all, there's some presets at the top. Let's just pop that to none so there's nothing on there at all. And then the next thing you've got is what kind of video are you going to make? So obviously there's a list of simple things like are you going to up by 200%, 300%, whatever? Do you want to go to full HD or do you want to put in your own figures? I tend to put in my own figures. All of my old footage is 4x3 and of course everything we look at these days is widescreen. So I'll make a square picture which is HD width and then when I go into my editing program I'll pan and scan it because I'm making it rectangular as opposed to square. I've got to chop something off. But if you just take the middle sometimes you chop off the wrong bits. So I make a nice big 4x3 image which is HD width and then I pan and scan it in the editing program. So I tend to put in my own figures because if I did something like HD, it's going to make an HD picture and it's going to have black bars down the side. And I don't want the black bars. I want to stretch it all out. So that's why I will put in my own settings. And for something like this, I would probably put in a width of 1920. It's put in a figure of 1536. The reason for that is that it's just taken this picture as it is and then upped it. So it's 1920 wide and then made the height match that keeping the actual aspect ratio of the original image. My image, this particular one, comes off of DV. Now, DV didn't use square pixels. It used little rectangular pixels. So if I was to do that, make it and put it into an editing program, you might find it comes out a bit tall, all to do with this aspect ratio thing that DV does. See, a proper 4x3 picture, which is 1920 pixels wide, is actually 1440 pixels high not 1536 but it's done it because the original is not made of square pixels i like to make things square pixels so instead of doing that i'm going to untick kip aspect ratio and put in 1440. now i know that's going to be the right aspect ratio people won't be stretched or anything and it's still going to be sort of hd full width and it's going to give me a bit of extra bit at the top and the bottom and i can decide which bit of the picture i actually want to use in editing so first of all i do that Next, you come down to the frame rate. Now, this is something that I have already deinterlaced. This program can actually do deinterlacing as part of the program, and you might choose to do that. I've deinterlaced this originally. I've done it in a program called StackScript, which I did talk about in a previous video. So have a look at that if you're interested in that, because that uses a particular kind of deinterlacing called QTMC, which everybody says is probably the best there is. But you can do deinterlacing in here, and I'll have a look at that in a minute. So this is why it's 50 frames a second. My original was 25 frames a second interlaced. So that's like 50 half pictures a second. You could choose to make it 25. You could choose to make it 50. If you make it 50, it keeps the same kind of movement as the original. So I like to do that. So that's just the settings for the size. That's pretty straightforward. Then you come down to the enhancement, which is like the, the most important stuff, all these different things here. Enhancement is about sort of scaling it. Face enhancement, obviously about improving faces. Colorizing, we'll take this stuff and make it color. It already is color, but suppose I had some black and white footage, I could pop it into this and it would colorize it for me. Motion compensation is actually, suppose you started with something that's 15 frames a second and you want to change it to 25, it will smooth all those things out for you. Because you know, you've got to create another 10 frames from somewhere. Well, in most editing programs, they'll do frame blending and they'll do optical flow and they do a fairly good job. This does a better job by doing fancier interpolation. 
Don't use that very often. It's only really if I've pulled up some really old videos taken on a phone or if somebody's scanned a cine film for me, which is probably at sort of 17, 18 frames a second, then I want to make that into something which is yeah, either 25 or 50. And finally, video settings. This is where you can actually change the brightness and the contrast. I never do that. I'll always grade it afterwards in my editing program. Obviously, this is here if you're not going to go to an editing program. And this is where you've also got deinterlacing. And then finally, at the bottom, you've got your output settings. Now, all the time I'm making video clips, I like to make as uncompressed picture as possible because I'm going to take it out of this and then I'm going to edit it. If you were just going to take the footage and save it and show it to somebody, upload it to YouTube or something, you'd probably use an MP4 or an MKV. No, I'm going to edit it. So I don't want to use an MP4 because that's really going to crunch the hell out of it. And when you then start doing it things later on, odd things can happen because you've seriously compressed it. It's much better if you're going to re-edit it to keep it in something a lot less compressed, like Apple ProRes. I'm using ProRes because everything just about gets ProRes. Obviously, there's other options, but under MOV files, you can only do ProRes or one of these, which is kind of the, the same stuff you put in an MP4 file, so why would you bother? If you go to AVI files, you've got uncompressed, basically. And now uncompressed would be great because it's the most lossless format, but it will take up bucket loads of space, which is why I tend to go for ProRes 422, because it will still take up quite a bit of space, but nothing near as uncompressed, and it'll still be a very good format to edit afterwards. On the audio side of things, see, pretty straightforward what you do there, but I just let it keep the original, and then where you're going to stick it. So I tend to just pop in here and then choose a folder where everything's going to be. So in my case, I'm going to put it in my AVC tests folder. So those are the basic settings. What about these specifics? Um, specifically, I fiddle with AI enhancement, face enhancement, or if I want to colorize something, colorize. So on the AI enhancement, this is where it's going to look at the image, analyze it, upscale it, and try and improve the picture quality. And you've got five different settings. Denoise, as it suggests, will just try and get rid of the noise in the image. The others are all to do with upscaling. You've got standard ultra and multi-frame ones. Obviously, Ultra should be better than Standard. It's doing more processing and it will take longer. I have to say, I don't always prefer Ultra. What I'd like to do is do a quick preview and then choose which one I think is the best. And then you've got multi-frame versions. Now, the multi-frame versions should actually produce a better result. Standard is just going to look at that frame and upscale it. Multi-frame is going to look at that frame and a few frames around it and try and use all that information to upscale properly. I mean, you can imagine if you've got a shot here and it's moving around, it's trying to make up detail in this boat, maybe, or detail in this person. Well, it might get a bit more detail in a different shot, in a different frame, actually can use to do a better job. And that's what the multi-frame does. It looks at a few frames around it. So better, but more intensive processing. Another thing I noticed is I first started testing this on a system with an NVIDIA 2080 graphics card. All of these AI things, they use the graphics card to do most of the work. They can use the processor, but the graphics card is much better at processing this, and that is what they're designed for. So you need a good graphics card. If you start to do this on a processor, it's going to take years. It's not that fast on a good graphics card, but it's going to take a lot longer if you're just using CPU power. They also take advantage of the latest kinds of graphics cards. So if you've got something with a 560 graphics card in it, forget it. It's just not worth it. You've got to buy a better graphics card. In particular, I was using a 2080. Now, 2080 is only a few years old, and it would have cost about seven or 800 quid originally. That's a very good graphics card for all sorts of things. But I did find when I was doing the multi-frame stuff, I was getting odd flickering all over the image. And I, at that time, came to the conclusion that maybe the multi-frames weren't as good as they were supposed to be. And then I looked in the instructions, and it says, if you want to do multi-frame, you need a minimum of a 3060 graphics card and a minimum of 8 gig of RAM on your graphics card. I moved AVC Labs over to this system, which has got a 3060, and, yep, they don't flicker anymore, and they do work better. And you might say, but I've got a 2080 and I spent a fortune on it. Yeah, unfortunately, things move on. It's worth spending more money to get a better graphics card. I think if you really want to get into this AI upscaling, you've really got to look at getting a better graphics card as well. And that's not just true for this program. This is also true for Topaz and it's true for Hippor. They all use the graphics card. 
Tried using some of them on older slow graphics cards and you might as well just give up and forget it. Definitely, you got a budget for a decent graphics card. I mean, a 3060 or a 4060, 3060s have been superseded by 4060s, and the 4060s are pretty much the same price. But a 4060 is about 300 quid, so it's not a huge amount of money, and it's worth it because of the amount of time you're going to be spending doing this AI upscaling if you're going to do some of it. But yeah, the multi-frame stuff, you need at 3060 or better, and as soon as I switched to that, it worked properly. Anyway, let's pop it on standard and have a quick preview at it to see what it's actually going to look like. So obviously I've got my output settings set. I pop into here and I want to get a preview of this. All you've got to do is click this little button here and it will preview 30 frames for you. And yeah, it's definitely improved it. You know, there's a little bit more sharpness around the edges of the boat here and so on. It's still being scaled to fit this image because I told it to be HD. My screen set to HD. So obviously this is not showing me the thing at the full size. So rather than fit... Let me just pop in here and go to 100% and you'll get a better look at what the image looks like. And yeah, that's definitely better. He's definitely a bit sharper. The words there, PA, yeah, that's improved it. Let's do the same thing, but instead go to Ultra, pop that on 100%. And yeah, I'm getting a bit more detail here on all these different types of things. So that is definitely better. And then you obviously can try some of the multi-frame ones and see what they do. Now, in my video clip here, it's just a few random samples of things. Obviously, that's not the greatest thing for me to actually have a look at because there's not too much in there to enhance. Let's just pop along to the clip to say this one here. Again, the same thing from taking from the same boat. Let's have a quick look at that being upscaled by clicking the preview button. What you can see there is, OK, I mean, it's still a bit blobby, but you are getting more detail in the trees. You are getting more detail in the house. In my own tests, I found for most things, I do like the ultra multi-frame better. The standard actually does look sometimes a little bit sharper, but also sometimes you can get flickering in different places. Now, this is the sort of thing, obviously, where if you're about to buy this, I would suggest you download the trial version and give it a go and see what you get with your own footage. See, that possibly you can't see on YouTube, but that one is actually slightly sharper as a result than the original but some of it's a little bit more blobby. You really need to see it moving over a large period of time and compare it to the original in something properly. This is just giving you a preview. What I'd then want to do is to export stuff and then compare it in an editing program. If you get the trial version of this program, then whenever you start it up, it says you get three goes at this and then it stops working. That kind of put me off to start because I thought three goes wasn't enough to decide whether I wanted to pay out for the program. What I did find out that it kind of gave me three goes at actually exporting a file. But even when it wouldn't let me export a file, I could come back in and I could do little previews on different types of clips. So you now I could do lots of different previews, but I could only export three final files to test before I had to pay for something. Another little thing about the preview here, which I did ask them about. I'll click the preview button and I'll get a little preview up here of the results. And then something that was slightly annoying is that I close that and it jumps back to the start again. I then got to go to that same part again, which I find to be slightly annoying. You could actually just come in here and uh, like, you know, I can come in here and go to 27 seconds or something like that. So you can do it from the numbers. But I did say that was annoying me. They said, yeah, that's a bug in the current version, the one that I'm using at the moment, and it's going to be fixed soon. And I'm on 3.31, which is the current version. Of course, this will change. The thing about these AI programs is that they are constantly being trained and they're constantly getting better. Now, here's some results from my different tests. I'm going to jump to this particular scene of the train because I think there's an awful lot of detail and stuff going on there. Now, this is the standard version. This one is. Ultra. This one is standard multi frame. And this one is ultra multi frame. Hopefully, you can see the differences between them. Obviously, YouTube's going to mangle this video, so I don't really know for sure if you can actually see it, but it is getting progressively better depending on which you do. Another thing that they've actually got is face enhancement. So, take this shot here, for example. If I've just got that on standard, and let's just do a quick preview. We get a decent looking result. What I do get on standard is you can see around here, I get the odd little patchy bits. I mean, this is a very, very peculiar looking background here, but I'm getting these little patchy bits here, which I don't like too much. That goes away if you put it on multi-frame. 
But in particular, the other thing I wanted to look at with this is the face enhancement. Now, the very first time I've used this on my 2080, I wasn't too impressed. But since I've been using it on this computer, actually, I think the results have been rather good. If you turn on face enhancement and then you fiddle with this slider, I actually find that the 50% starting a point is actually quite good. It will take that face and try and improve it. So let me just set that going. It'll take longer because the face enhancement is adding more processing power. You can see you're doing two things now. Well, what it's trying to do here is take that face, kind of smooth it out and get rid of a lot of the noise and add a bit more definition to it. Now on that shot there, you can see I've got definitely got more definition in the jump. But on my face, it's a bit better. There are definitely more hairs on my face and that kind of thing. Let's crank it up a bit more and we'll do another preview. And yeah, you can see you're getting a bit more definition around the eyes there. In some ways, getting rid of some of my freckles. I do look a bit pocky there, but it's getting rid of some of my freckles. Let me just go back and take, turn it down a bit. Another preview. All these previews, I'm skipping through them for the purpose of this video, so you don't have to wait. They are taking probably about 15, 20 seconds to preview a couple of seconds, which gives you a good idea of how much oomph is going on. They're putting it a little bit lower. It hasn't done so much on the eyes, but obviously you can see you're getting a lot more stuff coming up in the jumper. I mean, just look at this wishy mess that's in the original, and I'm actually seeing the lines that were in my jumper there. But I found that that actually has done a pretty good job of souping up my face or, or all sorts of faces. I find if I put it all the way to the top, it tends to go a bit too far on some things and people become more like a cartoon image. But I think the sort of 50, 60 percent that it starts with is a really good result. You see there, I've got a bit too smooth, a bit too cartoon, even though my eyes have got sharper. Oh, you know, I've got a little sparkle in my eye there. But I think that's probably a bit too much. That's why I think the 50% is good in the first place. You can also refine that a bit further. If you go into the settings, under face recognition accuracy, I can whack that up. So you can go lowest, medium, highest. Put it up to highest. Try it again. Now it's going to take a bit more time to do it, but it'll do a better job at finding faces and improving them. I mean, to be perfectly honest, the original shot here to me looks like it's all out of focus as well. <laughs> Let me take this particular shot, which is one of the things I did use for my video on Topaz. But if you pop into that, I've got the face enhancement on, I've got the ultra on. Let's just do a quick preview of a few frames of that. You can see there that the really fuzzy mess there, the face enhancement has actually done a pretty good job of bringing out that to that. You know, her hair's got some nice fine details in it. There's a lot of nice details around here. You've got an eye in there. It's done a good job, I think, of enhancing that to make it something a bit better. From this watch was a Hi8 original filmed on a domestic Sony camera many, many years ago. So I like the face enhancement, just don't overcrank it. My personal settings are probably going for ultra multi-frame and face enhancement about 50 and 60. This image, as you can see, just like this one, they both got crap down the sides. I mean, this is typical Hi8. You had a black bar on either side bit of a ragged edge there and this gubbins down the bottom. Now since I'm going to widescreen this I'll end up using sort of the top half of it. I don't really care about the bit at the bottom but I've really got to get rid of those things because if I scale that to 1920 it'll still have the black bars on it and I don't want those. So what you can do is come in here and just crop it. I'm going to keep the original ratio thingy in there so I can make sure that I don't completely mess up the aspect ratio. I've done that occasionally in videos. Let's just get it set up. Bosh. So I'm keeping the original aspect ratio. I'm moving around so I don't have that bit there, but I'm making sure I don't have any black bars down the side. Yep, quite happy with that. And I'm going to tick this thing apply to all videos. Now, it might not work for my other one. I might need a different crop on that. Normally, I'm using everything from the same source. So I'm doing everything from one particular camera. There's lots of videos from the same camera. It's great that I can apply the crop to all of them, not having to do it one at a time, which I used to in certain other programs. Now, there you are. I've changed it so I'm not going to have black bars down it, still got most of the image, I've still got the settings correct so it's still going to fit my HD screen and then I can again do a quick preview see what it looks like, yep that's looking rather good or probably as good as it's going to get, it's never going to look like an HD image but it is cleaner and it's nicer and it's got some more detail in it, 
but then I can just click the start processing and off it goes and chunders through all those videos. It isn't the fastest thing in the world and it will get better if you have a better graphics card. That is true of all these AI programs. They all take a lot of time and effort. And if you've got long videos, you just got to let it get on with it. It's been very good at getting very consistent results. It doesn't quite have the customization that you do in Topaz and I do like fiddling because I'm a bit of a fiddler. I can also completely lose myself spending ages and ages and ages fiddling with parameters, making things a bit too sharp. That's been one of the complaints of the stuff that I've done in Topaz is that you made it a bit too sharp, a bit too computery because you fiddled too much. This doesn't have all the same options, but it is fairly consistent. Good sort of all rounder. And of course, like I said, it's going to get better because they'll train it more in the future. So here's a couple of videos done with face enhancement. This is set to about 50. And this is set to 100, which, as you can see, the 100 is a bit over the top. So I would recommend leaving it around the middle. And of course, the other thing I forgot to mention, you can trim stuff. So if I didn't want to do that, if I actually just wanted to do the train shot, I could say trim, get to the train shot, clonk. So that marks the start point and clonk. That marks the ending point. And I could just do that little bit on its own. So it's now only going to do the train shot for me. The other thing I have done in this is colorizing. So let's get rid of these and can't really show you the stuff that I have been using because I have been using it to colorize old videos of Doctor Who. I'm a big Doctor Who fan and they've got lots of stuff made from the 60s and I've been taking those and colorizing them using AI. But you can do a better job of colorizing if you do it manually, which is long work and time consuming. But if you want to see it done properly, they actually recently released a colorized version which you can see on BBC iPlayer of the original Dalek story from 1963, which is done very, very well. But that's done by people sitting there and manually coloring every frame. I'm trying to do it with the AI because I haven't got that amount of time. And I've tried this in a couple of different programs. The other one I've got a video on is Hip Paw. Rather like the way this one does it. So rather than use the copyright TV program, I'm just going to take this clip, which I've taken the color out and colorize it. Let's just pop through say, to that shot there. You can do your enhancement at the same time. I'm going to turn off face enhancement and I'm going to put this on standard just to be a bit quicker. Mainly I'm going to come to colorize and colorize is very simple. You have a render factor. I did ask what this render factor meant because it wasn't really mentioned in the instructions. And they said the render factor defines the depth at which the colorization is performed. The higher the value, the more vibrant the colors will get. Mostly, I find if I put it up right at the top, I get the best results and it takes a bit longer. But sometimes, depending on the shot, it's actually better to go a bit lower. What I really want to do is put an entire 25 minute episode of Doctor Who in here and let it go through and colorize the whole thing. Now, when I do that, I get good results and I get results which are at least as good as hit poor. But I think I get better results by going through and doing it scene at a time. Now, that's going to be more effort but still won't be as bad as colorizing each frame individually because there's 37,000 frames in there. And overall doing a better job than say using Photoshop, which I also used for colorizing in one of my videos. Just to give you an idea, I'm gonna whack it back into the middle and do a quick preview. So this is upscaling it and colorizing it. And that hasn't done a bad job there, has it? I mean, it's not entirely right. Looking at that, there's some blue up on the hills. It's almost like you've got water there as well as down here. But actually, that's looking fairly realistic to me. And it's about as good as you're going to get with AI stuff. It's not going to be perfect. It's going to be much better if you do it yourself. Let me just whack it up a bit more. So I'm going to put the colorization factor up a bit more. And there, well, yeah, I'm still, I'm getting a little bit of the old blue down here, but nothing up there now. But is it any different? I think it's got slightly less color than the original, possibly. And then whack it down a bit further, so towards the bottom. And again, do a preview of that. On the colorization, there was something new added in 3.4. The render factor is still there, but they've added in the option to be bright and soft. Now, again, these new options, you kind of had to just try it on your footage and see what it comes like. On the stuff I've been doing, I quite like to go soft and put the render factor all the way up to the top. We do a quick preview on, say, this. You can see there the, the soft version. This is the original color version, and this is the colorized version. And you can see there what the soft version looks like. It's quite subtle on the colors. Let's put it onto the bright version. And this particular shot, the soft version was getting kind of blue at the top here, and I prefer the color of the hills that it's put in there. 
I think the bright version is better, but I think it does vary depending on the shot. And obviously you can fiddle with the render factor. So essentially it's doing the same as it was before, but it's a bit better. Interestingly, they're putting the render factor down a bit. I get, actually, I think a better looking C. Like I said, it does kind of vary per shot. I am cheating by using the colour one as the source, but it's simpler to show you the comparison between the two. Now, I haven't quite made my mind up, which is my favourite setting. Like I say, I think it might vary depending on the shot, but it is doing a very good job for something where I effectively just pop it into the program and let it get on with it. Not as good as painting it individually yourself. Will AI colorization ever be that good? I don't know. It's getting better and better all the time and we've only just started, so maybe it will. But right now that's giving me what I think is a good and consistent result compared to everything else I got out there. So I really like the colorization on there as well. Other thing I didn't mention was about deinterlacing. Now, in all the tests I've done in all of these upscaling programs, I've generally found that I prefer to deinterlace in Stackscript and then to upscale in the program. You can't actually deinterlace in Hitpour, but you can deinterlace in Topaz. So when I approached testing this, I also did the same thing. I used some stuff that I deinterlaced in the Stackscript and then did all my tests using that. So most of the stuff you've seen in this video has been stuff that's been pre deinterlaced. But having played a bit more with this program, I'm kind of convinced that it's probably better to just deinterlace and upscale inside of this program as opposed to using Stacks Rip first. I think it does a slightly sharper job. Sometimes there's a little bit of shimmering, but it does get more detail out of it if you deinterlace in here, I think. I've done previous videos about how to use Stacks Rip, so you can obviously try it yourself if you get hold of a program and see which one you prefer. The idea of Deinterlacing in Stackscript and then upscaling in here. It's a two stage process and it's boring and tedious and it'd be much better if you could do it all in one. So the fact that I think it actually works better by deinterlacing in here and upscaling at the same time is actually a good thing. As you can see here on the guy's movement, you've got lots of little jaggies because it's interlaced. I'm going to go to the video settings, turn it on. Not going to fiddle with the brightness, saturation, or contrast, but I am going to tick the deinterlacing. And then let's do a little preview of that. So I'm also upscaling, but I'm deinterlacing at the same time. And looking at that, obviously it's quite happily got rid of the interlacing stripiness on it. Has it done a better job than you can do in other things? So here in this Dallas style picture, I've got deinterlacing and upscaling in AVC all in the one program. Then deinterlacing in stack group first and upscaling in AVC, which I think you'll probably agree that the AVC one's a little bit sharper. And then as a comparison, I'm just doing the whole thing inside of Premiere. That's deinterlacing and upscaling. If you look closely at the Premiere one, and that's assuming that YouTube hasn't mangled this for you, but if you look closely at the Premiere one, you can clearly see lots of jaggies and horizontal lines on all the fine details. It is looking at the fine details. You're not looking at the overall picture. You've got to look closely at it to see the kind of rubbish that you get if you deinterlace inside an editing program. Like I said, I think the first one, deinterlacing and upscaling in ABC, gives me the best result. A new thing that was added in 3.4 with the video settings is the ability to sharpen the video. Now, obviously, you can see that it is basically a sharpness, but it does let you sharpen the video and then use the AI on it, which can produce a better result. Now, obviously, you can go all the way up to 100, or you can take it down to minus 40, so it gets blurrier. Again, it's one of those things you fiddle around with it, do a couple of previews, and see what you like. Obviously, I've done that. The whole thing's a bit sharper, but let's do a quick preview. I've got Ultra on the enhancement. I've put a bit of sharpness on in advance. Do a quick preview and see how that comes out. Obviously, the whole image looks quite a bit sharper than it did in the first place. I'd say looking at that, I probably had too much sharpness in there, so I might go back, turn it down a bit but it can improve some videos. Anyway, hope that's given you an insight into AVC Labs Video Enhancer. You can see the current prices that they are here at the moment. So like most things, you can get a one month plan, a one year plan, or a perpetual plan, which are fairly similar prices to Topaz and Hitpaw. For the purposes of this video, they did give me a copy, which was very nice of them, but I don't get any kickback or anything if you go and buy it from them. You can get a trial from here, try it out, and then decide which one of these you want to go for. But my conclusion is really, I think it's a good all-rounder, and it does the colorization, it does decent upscaling, 
and does decent face enhancement. So I think a good all-rounder. Go there, get a trial, have a go and see what you think. If you need to know more information about video editing and that kind of thing, then go to my website, www.dvctraining.co.uk. You can always contact me at david at dvctraining.co.uk. Of course, don't forget to like this video and subscribe to the channel and I'll see you next time.